Well, let's take a look at the Digital and PMOD ACL accelerometer. We'll discuss the conceptual operation, applications, pins and sensor coordinates. We'll look at the detailed configuration example of the registers and how to read accelerometer data. This is the accelerometer that's included in the NI MyRio Mechatronics kit. It's the Digilent PMOD ACL. It's based on the analog devices ADLX345. This is a three axis accelerometer. Well, to begin, let's just consider some general ideas about accelerometers. This is a device that measures the acceleration of an on chip proof mass. And here's the concept. Imagine that you have a little slab of material. This is called the proof mass. And at the four corners, it's attached to a frame by a suspension. Now there's two cases that can happen here. If we imagine that the suspension moves, say the suspension moves in this direction, due to inertia, the mass wants to hang back. You'll see that there's a relative motion between the proof mass and the suspension and you measure the change in position and report that as acceleration. Before I introduce the second case, quick comment back here. This idea is based on the accelerometer in outer space or in free fall. So initially the proof mass and the suspension had no relative motion. Now, when the accelerometer is in a gravitational field, so this is a second case, suspension is stationary, proof mass is drooping down, simply because its mass pulls down towards the ground. Now the interesting thing here is that this is the same end result as case one, and in fact the two cases are completely indistinguishable from each other. So any relative motion between the proof mass and its suspension is acceleration. I'm going to define the direction of positive acceleration going, going up, and in this case, the accelerometer would report a plus 1g acceleration. The sign indicates the direction of the accelerating suspension. And this is based on what I was calling case number one. However, if the suspension is stationary, that's case two, and you can't tell the difference. It's still reported as plus 1g. Let's review some applications for the accelerometer. For static or constant acceleration, you can use an accelerometer to determine the overall orientation of your device. You could use it as a 3D pointing device, for example. You can use it as a level or a tilt sensor. You can also use it as a drop sensor. Dynamic acceleration, you can use this as a motion sensor and also to detect and measure shock and vibration. Next, let's look at the specific features of the analog devices ADLX345. This is a three axis accelerometer. It has four ranges going from plus minus 2G all the way up to plus minus 16G. We have 10 to 13 bits of resolution possible. At plus minus 16G range, that tells us that we have 32G peak to peak divided by 2 to the 13th gives us 3.9 millijes per least significant bit in all ranges. We have 16 data rates possible ranging from 3200 hertz all the way down to 0.1 hertz. It supports I2C and SPI serial communication. In this tutorial I'll be focusing on I2C exclusively. Device ID is 1D hexadecimal and it supports the standard and fast modes. This device has a 32 level FIFO, supports event detection including single and double taps, activity and inactivity as well as free fall, has dual interrupt outputs, and the supply voltage is VDD equals 2.0 up to 3.6 volts. Now looking at the overall board, the PMOD ACL, the I2C and power and ground pins are located right there. Looking at the J1 connector on the side, this is side view, J1, top of the board, pointing up like this. That's pin one on the top. The two pins 
that are associated with interrupts are located on the bottom row. That's interrupt number two and interrupt number one. You also have access to ground and power pins on J1. Those are doubled up as well. Now looking at the sensor orientation, if we zoom in here a bit, there's the chip. And right here is pin one marking on the chip. And according to the data sheet, we have the coordinate system laid out like this. This is positive x, x direction going this way, positive y direction like this, and because the coordinate system follows the right hand rule, that means now that positive z is pointing out of the page or out of the top of the board. These marks, by the way, if you look carefully on the PMOD board, are indicated as well. x, y, and Z is indicated off to the side. All right, let's turn our attention to configuring the registers on board the accelerometer. I will focus on a subset of the 30 available registers and encourage you to see the full data sheet at analog.com for complete details. When you're experimenting with a device, make sure that you never access these registers between address one and one C. Now, all except three registers default to zero after power cycling. Auto indexing applies to all registers for read and write operations. And that means when you write a single byte to point to a particular register address and then read or write that byte, then subsequent reads and writes will access the next register in order. All right, those are some general observations. Let's take a look at a specific detailed example. I want to select a 200 hertz data rate, which is twice the default rate. I would like to select the plus minus 8G range and maintain full 13-bit resolution. I want to keep the defaults for I2C data transfers and active high interrupts, and then set up a single tap detection on the X axis exclusively with a 3G threshold and 10 millisecond maximum duration. I'll generate this input on output pin int interrupt two. I also want to generate a data ready interrupt on the output interrupt number one. After that, we'll take a look at taking measurements and also looking for single taps. All right, let's begin with selecting the 200 Hertz data rate. This is located in the BW rate register, address hexadecimal 2C. I'll use gray to indicate the bit fields that I'm not gonna work with, and then black to, to be the ones that are of interest. The rate bits are the lower four bits. Table seven of the data sheet says that 200 Hertz is selected by 1011 for that bit field. By the way, the rate defaults to 1010. This is one of the three registers that has a non-zero default. Pull those bits out, express that as a hexadecimal value. We would have zero, and these four bits is hexadecimal B. So we want to write hexadecimal B to address 2C. Next, let's go ahead and select the plus minus 8G range. This is the data format register at address 31 hex. We need the full res bit as well as the two range bits. Table 21 says that the plus minus 8G range is 1, 0. The full res option is selected by setting this bit to a 1. Now also in the data format register is how we take care of selecting I2C. And the default actually is I2C operation, so the SPI bit would be 0. We want active high, so we do not want to invert the interrupts. That means the interrupt invert bit must be zero as well. All the other bits default to zero. Pull that out and we find the value hexadecimal A. This is the value we want to write to address 31. Next, single tap detection on the X axis only. This will take a number of registers to set this up. First, I'll begin with the tap threshold register. This is at address 1D. This is an unsigned integer, 
And we get this by selecting our threshold in G, in this case 3, divide that by 16G and multiply by 256. That gives us the value 48, which is 30 hexadecimal. And that's what we write to address 1D. Draw your attention to an interesting point here. You'll note that the 3 shows up as part of the hexadecimal number, so that, that can be kind of a handy shortcut if you're just trying to experiment with integer values of threshold. For duration, this is at address 21 hex. This is also an unsigned integer. We specify our duration as a fraction of 160 milliseconds. So we'd say 10 milliseconds divided by 160 milliseconds times 256, that's 16, and that's hexadecimal 10. Well, that takes care of the threshold and the duration. Next, we want to enable detection only on the x-axis and then generate the suitable interrupt on int 2. The tap axes register is hexadecimal 2a. We want to access just this bit right here, tap x, set that to 1, and then leave the remaining bits 0. And that gives us hexadecimal 4 for the tap axes register. Now we want to generate interrupts on interrupt number 2. This is the interrupt source register at address 30. It has a number of bits in here. This is a read-only register, by the way. And the single tap bit is located right there. Now, turning our attention to a, a writable register, this would be the interrupt mapping register. Notice that every bit lines up. So we say that for the single tap interrupt, we want to set a one bit at that position. And that's how we get something routed to interrupt number two. If it's a zero, then it gets routed to interrupt number one. That means we would then write hexadecimal four zero to register two F. Finally, we need to enable the interrupts out to the pin. This is the interrupt enable register at two E. Again, every single one of these lines up with the other interrupt related registers. I am now enabling the data ready and the single tap interrupts. All the others are set to zero. Now there's an important distinction here. I'm going to star three of these bits. And that includes data ready, watermark, and overrun. Now these interrupt functions are always enabled back in the interrupt source register. And that is a register that you could choose to read directly if you like. Setting a 1 for one of these starred bits means that you simply enable that interrupt to appear on the output. For one of the others, however, this means that you are enabling the function and you are enabling the output on the pin. Altogether, that bit pattern is C0 hex. Second observation I'd like to make here is that the interrupts are all ORed together. So that is, if you have multiple inputs, or multiple interrupts rather, that are routed to the same pin, you have to read the interrupt source register to determine which was the active interrupt or possibly multiple active interrupts. All right, that takes care of the data or the data ready interrupt on interrupt number one as well. Now let's switch from standby to the measurement mode. And this is in the power and control register at address 2D. This is the bit of interest. This is the measure measurement mode bit. And this needs to be set to a one. And we keep all the others at zero. This value is zero eight. So you write that out to the register 2D and measurements start happening. We wait for activity on the interrupt number one pin. That's where the data ready interrupt was mapped. And then once you detect activity, you write the address of the data x0 register. After that, you read six bytes in quick succession in the same I2C bus transaction. It's important to get all six bytes out as rapidly as possible. These read out in the order of data x0, data x1, data y0 and y1, and then finally z0 and z1. 
Reading the data means that the data ready interrupt gets cleared. Now, data zero for any one of these is the least significant byte, and the data one is the most significant byte. You join these bytes together into a 16 bit signed integer. It's important to remember that it is signed. Also, only 13 of the bits have meaning. You then convert to G units by taking the data value, dividing by 256, and multiplying by 1G. That gives us the acceleration in Gs. In terms of taps, you wait for activity on the interrupt 2 pin. You then read the interrupt source register to clear that, that single tap interrupt.